turn uh, during to modulate the discussion. Anyway, I saw one hand raised up there. Ho visto qualcuno con la mano alzata e poi anche altri. Per cortesia, dite come vi chiamate, a che, di che istituzione fate parte. Per cortesia, parlate nel microfono. Se lo fa lei, no, ma eh, scusa, il dito è di la persona dietro. Eh, Hello, my name is Helmut Roniger. I'm at the Royal London Hospital of Integrated Medicine. Um, my first question is to Professor Calabrese. Um, your, your curves seem to have all the same shape. Uh, is there a way uh, to predict if you, for instance, say a suppression of 30% is 100% uh, where the peak of a drug effect, of the homeases effect, would be? Well, where the peak is, uh, first of all, all these uh, dose responses were normalized to a control value, mm -hmm. so that's why we saw the, that they were similar. Uh, in terms of uh, where the peak value is with, with respect to our database, uh, in general, it was approximately about five to seven uh, um, fold from where it passes the, uh, the control value. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that would vary, of course, between studies. But in general, with the systems that we have in the database, that's, that's what we saw. Thank you. I've got one other uh, uh, thing about the difference between homeopathy and homesis. Um, uh, where home, homesis, as far as I understand, is just one, one upswing and then one downswing, and not continuing up and down in, in, in eternity. Uh, in, in homeopathy, at Geary today, we more or less agreed that it's a general phenomenon that you have got a fluctuation with, with peaks and troughs, which are many more, multi, many more than just one up and down, particularly in the ultramolecular range. I'm not sure I would agree with that. Uh, I, I haven't... Uh, um, I haven't seen those kinds of dose responses. Maybe I haven't done enough studying of uh, homeopathic uh, literature, so I, I could claim some uh, lack of knowledge on that front. I would. Um, I have seen situations in which, uh, even though I focus most of my work on looking at biphasic dose responses, I, I have to tell you that I. I, am, uh, I have observed and I'm interested in uh, triphasic dose responses that I have seen uh, and that I believe I have some mechanisms to account for some triphasic dose responses. Uh, and I've seen some uh, other situations that appear to be more sinusoidal. I've seen that. I haven't seen them often, but I have seen them in some biological systems and the studies seem to be quite reliable. And so, uh, i allow myself to be surprised um, because even though I tend to see most things within a biphasic framework, I do see that, that in fact uh, um, there are other ways in which uh, cells respond at different times and, and those are things that, um, that of course we need to, to know and to understand and perhaps to use to our benefit. And, so, and also I'd like to say that sometimes um, i, you know, I, I have observed, uh, you know, uh, threshold dose responses that seem to be quite reliable to me, and so, and so the situation is such that uh, I'm not uh, a total monolith when it comes to the belief in a biphasic dose response. I see that as the dominant dose response, but I see exceptions to it, and and I believe that, uh, you know, we have to follow the data and to try to understand, you know, why it's going on in such a fashion, but. But uh, my belief is that the, as I mentioned in the talk, is that for historical reasons and, and, and experimentally challenging reasons, the biphasic dose response has been, uh, and the language associated with it, has been um, unappreciated and should be appreciated more and, um, and exploited more, you know, for, um, uh, for human better understanding and, and, other, uh, and other applications. Okay, there was the second question here. Funziona? Sì. Sono il dottor Mer. 
I'm Dr. Mechadi from the Masakarara Hospital for Complementary Medicine. I'm the director of the course in Complementary Medicine, which is held in this health unit. I wanted to go back to what Dr. Bernardini said. I am um, of the opinion that there's no homeopathic nor allopathic or hormetic medicine. There is medicine, and it's what is used for treating patients to make people feel well and to provide treatment and prevention. In this view, I think that we should overcome any type of vision. We should try to understand the mechanisms, the complex mechanisms that we've seen studying hormesis, which lead to studying the low and ultra-low dilutions and understand, and I think I've understood from these studies, that these have been presented over these two days in this European conference that there are possibilities and there are studies which talk of uh, uh, studies that go below the level of advogadro and there are these dilutions of these drugs. Uh, so I think we should work in synergy in this direction because in this way we are providing a service to man. We are providing medicine which is to the service of everyone using all possible means at our disposal. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Fisher. Uh, and thank you, Simonetta, for, for showing my journal off. No, I've dropped my paper. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, uh, and actually I must apologize to Professor Calabresi for, for involving him in guilt by association. You know, I do apologize for being a homeopath and anything like that. Um, but I wanted to bring to your attention a body of work done by a guy called um, Teixeira, uh, Marcos Zulian Teixeira, who's based at the State University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who's done a large body of very meticulous work looking at the, at the, the effects, the, the, well, the reverse paradoxical um, and rebound effects, and also the, the um, adverse effects, particularly the so-called type 2 or idiosyncratic adverse effects of conventional drugs. And he's done this, for instance, for SSRI antidepressants. It is well known, of course, that SSRI antidepressants can have the paradoxical effect they can promote suicide, they can cause suicide, and he has studied the exact circumstances in which this tends to happen. And it tends to be in younger people, and it tends to be early in treatment. More recently, he has looked at the uh, reverse effects of bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates is a blockbuster drug, just like SSRIs. Tons of them have been sold. And since their introduction, there has been a reduction, it is quite true, in typical, for instance, uh, femoral neck fe fevers. But there has been an increase in atypical fractures, subtrochanteric fractures, unusual fractures. And again, the, there appears to be a mechanistic explanation for this uh, in terms of osteoclast activity. So, and, and this brings me really to a comment on this, in my view, completely futile debate about is homeopathy hormesis or not. I would say that they actually all both belong to a wider group of conditions there, which, for which, as far as I know, doesn't have a name, but there are things like reverse effects, rebound effects, DDRE, dose-dependent reverse effects, there are idiosyncratic side effects, there's paradoxical pharmacology, there's a whole lot of words that are used for phenomena where you get reversed uh, effects or reversed or paradoxical effects as a function of dose, as a function of time, or as a, very importantly, I think for homeopaths, as a function of idi individual idiosyncrasy. And there suddenly there is a link between the type 2 side effects, you know, which are the rare idiosyncratic but sometimes fatal, very serious ones, uh, uh, and homeopathy. And just finally, I just wanted to, uh, to apologize to, to Professor Dallara for correcting him. The number, Avogadro, it was not, the, it was not Avogadro who discovered the number. As our German-speaking colleagues will tell you, it was Loschmidt, and you will upset the Germans. Avogadro discovered the principle. Loschmidt, an Austrian, discovered the, the number. However, I'm a rheumatologist. I do use APIS a lot. I would certainly welcome doing clinical trials. Thank you very much. <laughs> I believe uh, Dr. Dolara knows this. Uh, a very bad habit. Always finding, like Meucci uh, invented the telephone. No, it's, you know, uh, it's okay. <laughs> Don't take it too seriously. It doesn't matter. We, you know, not, yeah. yeah, no, okay, thank you. <laughs>
posso rispondere? May I answer just one thing? I agree, Peter. Were... Sono d'accordo con... So... I agree with you that the discussion or mesis and homeopathy is a useless debate. If we don't want to do this, so much the better. Let's start using the way of hormesis as a key of interpretation of the action mechanism of homeopathic medicine, at least in low doses. But since today the homeopathic community has split on this precise point, we cannot refer to hormesis for the action of the homeopathic action, medical action, we have to talk about it. Otherwise, we would take it for granted and we would go ahead, let's discover this world, let's open this door, let's see what they do, uh, uh, the homeopathic medicines at the cellular level, and we will have some, enjoy having some new knowledge. It's a homeopath who wanted to uh, divide the two worlds. First of all, I want to uh, thank you for uh, this very interesting symposium, and it's great I don't want to fight at all, uh, be sure. Uh, I would like to ask you, Dr. Calabrese and Dr. Ives, uh, uh, somehow related to the previous uh, question, how is included time in uh, uh, Ormesis? Uh, I want to take advantage of the example you did with uh, Digitalis or Wabain. Of course, as a function of time, even low concentration of Wabain may have a positive inotropic effect, and then you have, because of the calcium overload, which is a mechanism that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know pretty well, you have a decrease in uh, contractility. And on the other end, if you have the other way around, so a negative effect at the beginning, and later on a positive one, like you can have with low, consent, low doses of, of beta blockers in head failure patient. Is the same mechanism or is it something else? In terms of uh, providing a, a general answer to the question, um, time is very important. And in fact, um, um, it's very important to have, if you can, not just dose responses, but dose time responses. When I first got involved with uh, the hormesis question, um, I actually uh, had uh, data that, that was dose time response. And in fact, uh, I'll go back to my very first experience, which I mentioned in my, in my lecture, which was when I had this, um, this uh, growth inhibitor um, inhibit plant uh, or stimulate plant growth at low doses and be inhibitory at high. But actually, if you looked at the effects of that over time, the first week it actually demonstrated a dose dependent decrease. It was actually a linear decrease. And then uh, at the second and third week, it, the low doses began to show what appeared to me to be um, a compensatory stimulation. And after five or six weeks, there was this uh, very um, uh, striking inverted U-shaped dose response. And actually, uh, within our hormesis database, one of our databases that has about uh, nine or 10,000 uh, examples of hormesis, uh, about 2,500 of those actually have a time component. And, and basically, what they show is that uh, is that there tends to be, in those examples, an initial perturbation of the system, some type of uh, disruption of homeostasis or um, low-level toxicity. And the, the organism seems to, um, um, to try to reestablish the homeostatic situation, but it does so um, typically by over, um, uh, an overcompensation response. But, it, but this is interesting. It doesn't overcompensate by threefold, four, five, tenfold. It, it really is tightly regulated, and it overshoots by 
in the percentage range, you know, that, that 30 to 60 percent range. And I said, oh, that's the reason, in the beginning I hadn't thought about it, but I, after I saw the, the uh, dose time responses, many, many of them, and I saw this, it came to me that, that actually the reason why the hormetic response was, was rather modest was that it was a, a simply an overcompensation to a, res to a disruption in homeostasis. And that the system, I, I, uh, teleologically speaking, wanted to get back to there, but it wanted to ensure that it would get back there, so it overshoots a little bit. There's an advantage to, to overshooting, but not by much. Now, I've also noted, so as initially I said, well, that's the answer here. But then I saw many different examples in which there was very close time evaluation and I saw no inhibition. But I saw a low dose stimulation and a high dose inhibition. And I believe that you know, those are acting perhaps through direct stimulatory mechanisms via receptors and uh, activating various uh, pathways. And high doses, uh, you know, certain in inhibitory responses take place. And so what I saw was, in one case, there seemed to be this hormetic response that was due to uh, an overcompensation to some type of stress response or some type of um, disruption of homeostasis. In other cases, it wasn't occurring, in my opinion, because of that. It was a direct stimulation. But one of the most interesting things that I got out of looking at those was the magnitude of the stimulation, the quantitative features of the dose response actually didn't differ whether you had an overcompensation response or you had a direct stimulatory response. And you know that they were acting through different mechanisms. Uh, and yet they still seem to be constrained by some type of uh, constraining factor, and, and uh, which I think is the, what I call the constraints of biological plasticity, whatever those ultimately are, are to be understood by, but I do believe it's resource conservation. So I hope that that addresses your question in a general sense. Uh, yes, my name is Robert Van Hausen. I have a, a question for you, uh, Professor Dolara, on, on mechanism. I mean, the, the finding you had at the level of gene expression, upregulation and downregulation, what kind of effect sizes did you see at the level of individual gene up or down regulation, and to which extent would it either support or maybe refute or have no impact at all on, on this statement of a 30 to 60 percent uh, window to respond? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Uh, our system uh, kind of uh, uh, raises all signals which are uh, below 1.5, uh, which means 50% uh, up regulation or down regulation. So we get all signals higher than 1.5 times. Uh, usually the up regulation that we see with low concentration is the order of two, maximum three folds. Uh, but, uh, you know, for gene expression, uh, it's, a, it's a big change because uh, we, we have uh, families of genes moving together. You know, uh, mm, the cells usually doesn't just, uh, when perturbated by some environmental or pharmacological variable, uh, does not respond to one single signal. I mean, gene regulation is different from uh, receptor signaling, which you have one molecule responding in the same way, and of course uh, the molecule is very much representing some type of cell, let's think neurons or cardiac cells. Here, it's an adjustment of the machinery of the cells, which is multiple. So a, a, a regulation up or down or twofold, uh, so a, a gene express twofold high or 0.5 low, which means a half uh, in the down regulation, all together connected with the family of pathways can have very big effects on cell function. Because, you know, from our experience, like in, for instance, in uh, nutrigenomics, uh, uh, even if you have dramatically altered uh, conditions of feeding an animal or a human being, you, you, you don't see very sharp variation of gene regulation. So a, an up regulation of two is already a big signal because it's not isolated, it's connected to a series of other pathways. I hope that uh, and, uh, answered your question. <coughs> anyway. Could I make uh, one, one uh, professional yeah. comment there? And that was that uh, I've seen in our um, 
uh, cell signaling pathway analyses uh, that you can see si signaling there that can be, um, I'm going to say, two to seven or eight fold over the control value. But ultimately, uh, how I interpret it is that those are, are um, they are what they are. They're, they're real numbers, and I can see them right there. But they ultimately lead to, to the formation of integrated responses, and that's how I, 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 I try to interpret it. So I, I don't try to actually. I, mean, I try to follow what, what's, what you see, and then try to interpret it. Um, so I even if they went up by tenfold or twentyfold, it really wouldn't affect my interpretation on an integrated response. <laughs> Sì, no, ma una bravissima chiosa, sono Luigi Turinese, medico, esperto in omeopatia, voglio ricordare. Just a short comment, I'm Chiesi, I would like to thank Bernardini and colleagues for, for bringing such important figures here, and I agree with Peter, there is no problem, I think that the uncertainties of some of our colleagues uh, uh, is something which makes them rather rigid. It's, uh, it's something about the philosophy of medicine. Uh, I include this fact because we talk about the theory of complexity according to which there is a possibility that there are partial truths that coexist, but they're not contradictory. And this also is to say that Hormes is will not be what we will be attached to um, for life or death. It's an explanation of the action mechanism of certain, of some homeopathic medicines, not all of them. And pharmacology is part of homeopathy. It's part of medicine. And it's not all of medicine. Therefore, I would like to point out that as a clinical therapeutic method, there is a medicine in general homeopathic medicine in particular, which include a rich semiotics, a restructuring of anamnesis and therapeutic restructuring. And this study on hormesis brings us many data, much data, which is part of uh, pharmacology, which is part of medicine. Nobody would say that medicine is pharmacology, so we shouldn't even say so for homeopathy, because otherwise we're going into a cul-de-sac of a different type. But thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, I think that uh, a mistake may derive from the fact uh, to consider the need uh, that uh, uh, homeopathy or hormesis are uh, different or equal. But uh, there is a, a, another interpretation um, that uh, uh, hormesis and uh, homeopathy um, have a, a, a basic level in uh, uh, shared. Because, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> uh, homeopathy is based on the um, study of uh, phenomenon. Uh, homeopathy is based on the, uh, the study of uh, the substances. For example, if you consider the fever as a, a, an example, homeopathy uh, approach the fever um, using some uh, different drug, belladonna, uh, aconitum, interpreting the, the, uh, the situation as phenomenon. If you use uh, hormesis, in this case you have to use interleukin that cause the fever. Is that different? the same range of delusion, look in uh, the experience uh, and they say, this is this gene, this is the other gene. They, call, they see, uh, uh, it's very beautiful, it's too complicated, but uh, they are able to identify many things. Uh, and uh, the picture obtained in, in his lab uh, is very, very, very intriguing. It's very, very fascinating for the future of the medicine. Uh, this is my this is my point. It's not. Uh, but no, uh, you know, I, of course uh, I am a chemist, so I am not a medical doctor, or a biologist, or pharmacologist, and so on. So, 
my experience is very limited. Uh, and also when, uh, yeah, any proposition is always formulated by an observer. Luigi, you congratulate for uh, 10 years ago, I, I stated this sentence, and I say, ooh, beautiful. He said, we can start. <laughs> See, this is the basis of every uh, scientific knowledge, this sentence. And uh, the same is uh, for, uh, for me, uh, is, uh, there is an overlap if, with the pharmacology and the, the therapeutic techniques. So, so I'm not, uh, so it's not a, so well uh, differentiate mechanism in order to answer to no. your uh, question. In the sense that I agree with, the, with the, uh, Luigi. So they show. Be because there are a part of homeopathy uh, which is maybe uh, in, in, uh, interpreted as hormesis, but uh, there are uh, another part in, in which the mechanism may be the same, but the interpretation is, uh, is, uh, uh, should, should, be, should be studied in different manner, in, in my opinion. I want to join uh, another thing. So, uh, Ed, uh, John, uh, Ocio Simonetta, you are enthusiastic about the work of Vigan and Evan Wake. This work, uh, 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 about 15 years ago, was uh, absolutely wonderful. Now, what uh, they found, uh, look, look to the result. So, if you receive a, a clock in your head, a clock in your ear, a clock in your leg, and so on, you have always the, some different reaction is not specific in the sense of overbound, but uh, the reaction is al always the, more or less the same. The, uh, the living system reacts in the sense of self, of maintaining his identity. So he protects himself. This is the key point. If Van Wick and Weigand uh, find always the same thing, still uh, they work till 10 to minus is smaller. No more. It's necessary to go 10 to minus 11, 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 15, 10 to minus 18, like uh, his co-worker did. Christina, you're around. So, you know, uh, uh, in order to, to see another world, another different perspective. Hopefully, but as a uh, State, these kind of studies are not easy and are not costless. Cost a lot of money, so the, uh, the production of a group in the university can be one study per year, no more. <coughs> Thank you. I think that we have to go because they, they want, uh, they say if you don't participate to the closing ceremony, they. Uh, they don't like uh, uh, this reaction. <laughs> Nevertheless, since uh, we get uh, two open ceremony, we can uh, <laughs> avoid uh, the closing ceremony. Closed. <laughs>